we are diving into residential assisted living and the writing's on the wall. There is a huge need for it. I do have a little bit of experience because my family has been in that business in the early 80s to 90s. They made really good money, but it was a lot of work. And I'm sure we didn't optimize it the way you can now with different systems. But with that, we have a resident expert in the field. We have Dr. Alex Slow, who has experience in the field. Alex, why don't you give the people a little bit of an intro before we get started here? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll also hit some intro in the slides here as well. But I'm Alex Slow. I'm a family medicine physician in the Air Force. I have a little bit of experience in a bunch of different asset classes in real estate from long-term rental, short-term rentals, house hacking, and residential assisted living. So we'll hit a bit of the journey along the way and focus on residential assisted living. So really excited to be here. Alex, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, really excited for this because there's a huge opportunity here. And I think a lot of people see it, especially a lot of healthcare people. All right, we'll get started. Like I said, Dr. Alex Schlow, family medicine physician in the Air Force, stationed in Colorado Springs. We're going to talk about 10 steps to open your first residential assisted living home today. This is a picture of my family. This is my wife and my son. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park, one of our favorite places here in Colorado. We absolutely love adventure. We absolutely love being outside. And that is partly why I invest in residential assisted living is to have the opportunity to get more uh, experiences like this with my family. I'm an Air Force guy, so I have to hit the objectives of what we're going to talk about. We'll talk a little bit about who I am, a little bit about my real estate journey, talk about the state of real estate investing in general right now with some of the different things that are at play with the markets, and then the pivot into residential assisted living. We'll talk about 10 steps of how to get started, and then we'll analyze a couple of deals that we've done as well. There are some experts in the residential assisted living space on this call. Feel free to interrupt me or if you have any thoughts, feel free to share those as well. There are definitely some folks here who do a lot more in the operations space than we do. All right. So a little bit more uh, about myself. So who am I? Uh, I'm a Christ follower, husband, father, Air Force family med doc, a real estate investor. I absolutely love coffee and love being outside. This is a picture here of my son, Jack, and I, when I was stationed over at Eglin Air Force Base, finishing up residency. He's a good bit bigger now, but that's one of my favorite pictures and always will be. I have it sitting on my desk at work and it's a constant reminder of why I work as hard as I do, both in the clinic and also in real estate as well. So my why, I've already hit on that multiple times, family. My family is the most important thing. I'm really excited to say that there'll be another Shalom boy coming into the house in June. So my wife is uh, expecting in June. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I see the thumbs up. Really excited about that. Uh, my poor wife is going to be outnumbered, but she's the best. I think she can handle it. So yeah, my why is my family and then to practice medicine and live life how I want. And I'll talk about that a good bit because I think a lot of folks here are healthcare workers, physicians, practitioners, respiratory therapists, nurses, all the above. And so we work really hard and it, it's easy to get burnt out in the medical field. And I think real estate or financial freedom in, to, in some capacity can really give you some freedom to practice medicine or nursing or respiratory therapy how you want to. And whether that's the ability to say no to an extra shift or not have to work overtime or not have to moonlight, that looks different for everybody. But I think real estate investing really offers that opportunity. So I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk to everybody here. So this is just real quick, some of our real estate investments. I just wanted to hit a little bit on our journey. I got a little bit of experience in some different asset classes and why we decided to pivot towards assisted living. The first picture here in the top left, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or pointer there, but that is the first house that I bought. That was a long-term rental now in Florida where I did residency. I bought that house actually for $58 out of pocket with a physician loan. There was no money down in 2018. And I'll be honest, I was terrified just to pay that 58 bucks to get that house, but it ended up just being an amazing investment. It's almost doubled in value. It cash flows about $1,000 a month. And it's just a really great house. My wife helped me fix it up. We were really excited about that. We pivoted into the short-term rental space and bought a house in LJ, Georgia with two partners. And we ended, ended up selling that not too long ago, actually, in March of 2023. That we had for about two years. That was our first short-term rental. We learned a lot. I will say that was the most expensive tuition I ever paid. But luckily, we were able to make that tuition back and more when we sold that house. The bigger pockets effect really hit hard in the LJ, Georgia area and the Georgia mountains. And we learned some important things such as really pivotal to make sure you have high-speed internet in a rural location. We just assumed that everybody did and we did not. And so that hit right before COVID, we found out, uh, or we bought this house. So that would have been a great time to have some high-speed internet. So we lost out on some bookings there, um, but just something to keep in mind. I know a lot of folks do some short-term rentals here as well. Uh, top right picture there, that's our primary residence. We actually house hacked the basement. We dug a walkout 
and added a, a separate entrance to house hack the basement. So we live for mortgage taxes and insurance free essentially in Colorado Springs. If you were to average out what the basement makes all throughout the year, which is pretty awesome. We're able to take that money that we save from our mortgage by house hacking our basement and then invest that into other deals. And it's really increased our savings rate dramatically and allowed us the opportunity to invest in some more homes and some more assisted living and syndications and so forth. Uh, this really cool dome you see here in the middle, this is a short-term rental we have up in the mountains of uh, Colorado. It's a very unique Instagrammable stay. This thing is just a cash cow. It's been incredible. It's a very unique property. It's got a great mountain view and it's about eight minutes from a ski resort, a small ski resort called Eldora in Colorado. Um, I put this on here because this house, if I had two to three more of them, I would never have to work again. And because the other thing that's important right now with a short-term rental space is you have to have these unique Instagrammable stays. You really have to go above and beyond for your short-term rentals to really perform well. So good furnishings, good pictures, unique stays really are going to do well in the short-term rental space. Alex is of course an expert in the short-term rental space. So feel free to ask him any questions going forward in regards to that. We hit on this a little bit during the intro. But what's happening in the real estate market today? So in the short-term rental market, we're seeing that average daily rates decrease. It's back to 2020 levels, depending on what area and where you're looking at. We've seen interest rates increase. Competition has certainly increased. There's a lot more short-term rentals on the market. Uh, and it's pretty time intensive. It takes time to manage these properties, or you can push that management off to a management company, but you're going to be paying 20 to 25%, which is really going to eat into your cash flow. It's certainly possible. We manage our short-term rentals and, and, and do just fine with that, but it's something to keep in mind going forward. Single family rentals are like long-term rentals. It's difficult to cash flow right now. If you were to buy something new, just with interest rates being so high. In multifamily and commercial, we're seeing a lot of these variable rates or bridge debt that's coming due, and we're seeing a lot more opportunity in that space in the future. But a lot of folks are really having a difficult time do it due to taking some bridge debt. An interesting time in the market as a whole. Flipping, burr investing, great ways to get started, great ways to invest, but we're also seeing higher renovation costs, higher supply, higher interest rate, which is making things a little bit difficult. And then wholesaling, same thing. There's a lack of inventory. Where are people going to move, especially if they have these low interest rates on their homes? It's really hard to afford something that's at an interest rate that's double or more than what they have. So that's what we're seeing in the market right now, which then led us to pivot towards residential assisted living. And of course, being a physician, take care of a, a lot of senior citizens and elderly folks and uh, definitely see the need for this. And we've all, everyone who's done rotations has done those rotations where they've gone to this really run down nursing home and had that really terrible experience. So this is completely different than that. So a residential assisted living home is not a nursing home. This is not like your big box facility. Uh, that you think of when you think of a nursing home like Brookdale or some of these other facilities. This is a residential home, a single family home that's a licensed residential property that provides assistance with activities of daily living for seniors. So those activities of daily living include bathing, showering, dressing, getting in and out of bed, or getting into a chair, walking, use it, using the toilet, cooking meals, those sorts of things. So not a whole lot of medical care is happening in your typical residential assisted living home. There is an umbrella of residential assisted living homes. So you can have homes that, that have more specialized care, like memory care for patients with dementia or ventilator homes or different group homes and so forth as well. But as a whole, we're just, we'll stick this talk to just focus more on residential assisted living. Elderly patients, elderly residents who need assistance with these activities of daily living is what I want you to think about. And these are really nice residential homes that have been converted to these assisted living homes. Here are three big reasons why we love investing in residential assisted living. Our company, Open Range Capital, so growth, freedom, and purpose. So growth, there's a massive de demand now and far into the future for these residential assisted living homes. And we'll talk about that more, but there's a massive wave of baby boomers who are reaching retirement age and beyond, we're actually going to have the highest proportion of older adults ever. So if you probably heard the silver tsunami, which is it was certainly something that we're seeing now that's, that's going to be happening now and into the future. So more and more demand. And we'll talk a little bit more about the numbers of that here soon. Freedom. By owning just one of these residential assisted living homes of the right size and type and operated well in a full home, you can create significant cash flow. There's folks in this room, in this call that are cash flowing ten dollars to $15,000 per month with one of their homes that they own and operate. That's life changing. That can enable you to leave your W-2, live life on your own terms. Six figures from one of these homes, run well and run right, is very attainable. It's a lot of work, which we'll talk about throughout but it's very attainable. And then purpose. We're most fulfilled when we're taking care of others and when we have a purpose, when we're serving others. And so assisted living presents an opportunity to merge financial goals with rewarding service and continue to serve others. So it's really great. You can provide residents a um, very nurturing environment and ensure that they're having the highest quality care during their golden years, uh, which is most important. 
So the silver tsunami, this is, I just included this because this is funny. AI, I'm sure we're all familiar with AI. You can put in a, like a little script and be like, hey, create a picture of a silver tsunami. So this is what I did. I put in the silver tsunami and have an elderly person on a surfboard. This guy looks awesome. He's probably not staying in one of our homes. And I hope to be surfing like him when I'm older, but it gets the point across of the silver tsunami. We have a Facebook group and another member in this Facebook group <laughs> put in similar terms for the silver tsunami. And this is what he got, which is hilarious. And just a truly incredible picture and also just classic America here that we see of the silver tsunami. But this is a great representation of what's coming as demand continues to increase. The demographics don't lie. The silver tsunami is coming. Uh, it's projected that the United States is ballpark about a million beds short right now with a deficit of 1.3 million beds by 2029. We're seeing that the baby boomer population is 77 million strong and 10,000 per day are turning 65, 4,000 per day are turning 85. Seven out of 10 of those are going to require long-term care. Seven out of 10 of the 77 million bo baby boomers are going to require some long-term care uh, now or into the future. And we can see the age demographics that are broken down here. Uh, about 82% of residents are actually in that silent generation. So ages 79 to 96 ballpark is going to be the silent generation. So the baby boomers, depending on how this is broken up, there's actually a boomers one category, which is 70 to 78 and a boomers two category, which is 60 to 69. I just decided to put these all in there. 60 to 78 is the baby boomer range, but we see that baby boomer generation makes up about 20% of folks that are in these homes or less. They got about 18% actually, if you're looking there at the slides and 77 million of those baby boomers are, are what exist in the population. And seven out of 10 of them are going to require long-term care which is 53,900,000 boomers that are likely going to require some long-term care. So residential assisted living homes, are, they're going to be in huge demand now and for decades into the future, which is really important as you're analyzing any real estate investment. What's the potential in the future going forward? Like I hit on already, we're already about a million beds short. They're projecting by 2040, 986,000 new units are going to be needed. And 42% of the population will be 65 and over by 2040. The population of folks that are 85 and over are going to grow by 111% by 2040. So again, a lot of demand now and into the future. So why do residents love residential assisted living homes? As we talked about before, these homes are a lot different than those big box facilities that you're thinking of. These are high quality, nice homes that the residents are able to live in that are safe, they're clean, and there's typically a higher ratio of caretakers or caregivers to residents. And so they're able to get more effective care, more efficient care and better care in these homes than what they're going to typically get in some of these big box facilities. Oftentimes, the folks that are putting these people into the homes are family members that typically live close by. So oftentimes, the family members live close by to the residential assisted living home and they're able to come by, see mom or dad or grandma or grandpa and be closer to them. And it's not only a smaller environment, but it's a more close knit family environment in these homes. Typically, depending on where you're opening one of these residential assisted living homes, you could have as few as five residents. Some homes are 16. That's the max in terms of residential assisted living, but there's also folks who will have larger homes um, like mansions that can be 20, 22 people. That typically requires a variance and is a little bit more complicated than what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, but these homes are also more cost effective as well. Um, so here's a couple of figures breaking down the cost. The cost of residential assisted living home uh, income is more than just living in a comfortable space. It typically is a comprehensive care package that includes assistance with activities of daily living, but also medication management, nutritious meals, social gatherings, recreational events, housekeeping, transportation. So it's pretty all encompassing in terms of what assisted living includes. In 2021, as you can see there, the median cost of assisted living was about $4,500 per month. Um, per resident. Uh, so about $54,000 per year. And that's uh, projected to increase to 7,776 by 2040. Of course, this is going to vary by state and vary by quality of the home and the level of care provided and so forth. But we see in Missouri, for example, the median monthly price was 3,300 in DC, it was 7,800. Bottom line is the senior population continues to expand. The need for more and more of these homes is going to increase dramatically and the cost is going to increase dramatically, which offers some opportunity for the operators and, and for investors to, to frankly profit by providing a great service for these residents. As you can see here, if we're comparing a nursing home, average is about $94,000 per year. A Just an in-home non-medical aid that's helping with some of these activities of daily living would be about $78,000 per year. And then assisted living about $4,500 a month, which comes out to $54,000 per year. So more cost effective for the resident and frankly, better care for the resident as well.
So we'll hit a bit on um, real estate investing structure, and we like to break this up into two different categories, okay? So there's two different ways um, to invest in real estate more, quote unquote, actively. So one would be to own the real estate and the operations, okay? So this means you own the home, you own the real estate, and you also own the business that's providing all the care to the residents, taking care of the residents, doing the day-to-day. Or you can own the real estate and lease the business to an operator. This is what we do in our company. So we have four homes right now. We're under contract on three more. My two business partners are also military and full-time and also have families that are really important to them as well. So we don't have the time to also operate the business. We're trying to figure out how to do that efficiently, but we would require a manager who runs the day-to-day. We just haven't had the time to figure that out yet. So we own the real estate, lease the business out to an operator. This is what I recommend to any physician that I talk to or a like really busy healthcare worker to consider doing because it's similar to a commercial lease. It's going to be less cash flow, but it's going to be way more passive because the operator is running all the day-to-day care and you own the business on a lease where they're paying you monthly rent, if you will. The cash flow, and again, this is just generality. So we're talking about owning the real estate and operating the business and owning the real estate, leasing the business out to an operator. As with any real estate investment, I like to think of cash flow as a spectrum. And one end of the spectrum is the most amount of work, the most active you can be, but the most potential cash flow. On the other end is the least potential cash flow, the least amount of work. Picture like your syndication or your mailbox money or like private lending scenario. Just requires you to wire over some funds and that's about that. And then you just get paid every month. So there's a spectrum of cash flow and a spectrum of passivity, if you will, when we're thinking about passive income and cash flow. So Owning the real estate and operating the business, that would be on the further end of the complexity, on the further end of the active side of cash flow. You get compensated accordingly. There's people, like I mentioned before, that are making $10,000 to $15,000 per month per home in cash flow. So that's after paying all their expenses, paying for their mortgage, et cetera, which is quite substantial. Of course, if you're uh, extrapolating that out over a year, you're talking about $120,000 or more potentially if that home's being operated well and having um, quality care. You can also own the real estate and lease the business out to an operator like we do. That's going to be way more passive, but it's going to have less cash flow, but it's a great way to do it as well. So like I said before, the operator runs all the day-to-day care. We have four homes right now. We're under contract on three more. For each of those four homes, cash flow between $2,500 at the least end, $5,000 per month. And we'll talk a little bit more about some deals that we've invested in and go through a deal deep dive at the end. Just picture in terms of passivity and how active you want to be in the business when you're thinking about how do I want to invest in assisted living? How do I want to get, get started? So the most important thing before we actually hit the 10 steps is you have to figure out your goals. What are your goals in investing in real estate? What asset class? do you uh, are you really interested in we hear shiny object syndrome all the time some people are like very anti shiny object syndrome and some people are, are accepting of shiny object syndrome the shiny object syndrome when it comes to real estate i like to picture it of you're going to a buffet you're just getting started you're going to a buffet you're trying a bunch of samples of different foods at the buffet until you figure out what food you really like and then you just chow down on that one i think it's the same way for real estate investing It is okay when you're first getting started investing in real estate to go to the buffet and sample a couple things. It's okay to get a short-term rental and a long-term rental and invest in a syndication and figure out what you really want. And then focus on that and focus on that solely. Shiny object syndrome becomes a problem when you found that one thing that works really well and then you get bored and then you jump into something else instead of just focusing on the one thing that's really working well where you can make a lot of money. For us, that's residential assisted living home. You also need to figure out, do you want to invest passively or actively? And this in a couple of forms, one being lease to operator or own and operate the home and the business. And also, or also, do you want to just invest passively? You invest as a joint venture or a syndication and then just receive cash flow. So you can figure that out as well. But it's really important to figure out your goals. If you haven't spent the time doing that, Write down, what does your perfect day look like? What does life look like for you in one year and in five years? And really take some time to focus on what your vision is. That's going to be really important for you. I can't stress that enough. So now you've decided, hey, you figured out your goals and you want to invest in residential assisted living. So we're going to talk about 10 steps to open your first home. Now, this is not going to, this is a teaser, if you will. I'm going to try and give you as much value and as much information as possible, but this is not going to be everything you need to get started, but hopefully helpful as you get started in your journey. So we'll talk about 10 different things. One's going to be state licensing requirements, locality regulations and requirements. We'll talk about estimating the cost whether you should rent or buy a home. We'll talk about evaluating your experience level as well as different partnership opportunities, funding the deal, finding the right home, hiring your staff, which is the most difficult part, building a marketing plan, and then getting ready to launch and some resources that can be helpful. All right, so step one is going to be the state licensing requirements. This is really important. I would say this is the first thing you need to do. You need to determine how you can become a licensed assisted living home in your state. 
What are the requirements? What do you need to do to the home to have that be able to be licensed? How many residents are allowed in the home? What's the application process? A lot of information to figure out initially. Once you figure out, hey, this is the state that I'm thinking of. This is the location that I'm thinking of. Figure out what are the state requirements and how can you make sure that a home you're looking for is going to be ready to be licensed or able to be licensed just from a state perspective. So here's some questions that are, are really important to ask. Don't worry about writing all this information down. I'm going to send Alex the PowerPoint slide as well so he can send it out to everybody with the recording. And then at the end, we also have a, a free ebook of, of these 10 steps in way more detail than what I'll be able to provide in the presentation in the slide. So don't worry about writing everything down. Step two is going to be looking at the locality regulations and requirements. So what I mean is if we're zooming in to one specific location, so we've already figured out what are the state requirements. Next, we need to figure out what is the city or municipality requirements for where you want to invest in. Each locality is different in the way that they allow um, licensing for residential assisted living and zoning uh, regulations and uh, use of homes in their area. So um, it's really important to look at who's the local licensing authority, what's the approval process um, from a locale perspective, what are the zoning or use restrictions. Um, oftentimes places or different municipalities will have uh, zoning restrictions that will be in place that'll say, hey, an assisted living can't be within 1300 feet as the crow flies of another. And so there's these different restrictions uh, that exist that can prevent a home from being licensed. And it's really important to know those. Also need to know what are the building types or codes that are required, safety requirements. A lot of these homes are gonna need fire suppression systems and sprinklers. Sometimes they're gonna need specific like door locks and a range hood to try and prevent grease fires. There's a lot of different specific safety requirements by location that may be needed and those can change based off each locality. Uh, also important from a state perspective and a locality perspective is how many residents can the house be licensed for? Different states and different municipalities are gonna have different numbers for that. For example, in Arizona where we invest um, mostly, that is 10. 10 residents is the most you can have as a licensed residential assisted living home. In Texas, it's 16. It just depends on each state. Typically 10, ballpark what you're going to see most commonly in terms of these licensed homes. And oftentimes there's square footage requirements as well. The bedroom has to be a specific size to have double occupancy or the square footage of the house has to be a specific size. And we'll talk a little bit more here soon about what makes an ideal home, if you will. But really important to figure out what is the approval process? What does the state and what does the locality recommend and require in order to get licensed as a residential assisted living home? Next, we're going to have to figure out estimating cost, right? And so these are broken down into 10 steps. These are things that you're going to be doing as you're going along. Not necessarily you got to check one, two, three off, but things that you're going to be doing as you're getting started in your investing journey for residential assisted living. And I broke the cost up by real estate cost and business cost. So we talked about earlier how you can own the real estate and also own the business, which is providing the care to the residents, or you can own the real estate, lease it out to an operator. So this is my hope is this will encompass both of those. And so you can get an idea for each of those. So from a real estate cost perspective, I have on this slide, and I apologize that it's pretty wordy, but it's self-explanatory. So some real estate costs, of course, are going to be either like your rent or lease amount or your mortgage payment in the purchase price of the home. Okay. That is of course going to be very variable on whether you buy the home, rent the house out, lease the house out. What's the cost of a house in the location that you're investing in those sorts of things as well. Okay. But most importantly, that home should be licensable and you should be able to comfortably maximize the number of residents in that home. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about the ideal home soon, but what we see a lot is people are like, Hey, I have this, this short-term rental that I want to pivot into a residential assisted living home. And we ask them a little bit more about the house and they're like, yeah, it's a thousand square feet and two bedrooms. And I'm like, hey, that's never going to work as a residential assisted living home. You won't make any money. You'll fit two or three residents in there. It's just not going to work. We'll talk again a little bit more about that here in the future. You need to also think about what are the renovations that are required? So we talked about the state requirements and locality requirements. That's going to likely require some renovations to the home in order to meet those requirements. Typically, you can always expect that these homes are going to need fire suppression, some wider doorways, grab bars, like a roll-in shower, sometimes a wheelchair ramp and, and so forth as well. But those are the things you can expect are going to be needed. The fire suppression, wider doorways, grab bars, roll-in shower. It may You may also need to add some more bedrooms or add some more bathrooms. The more bedrooms and private bathrooms you have, the more you're going to be able to charge because folks really want these uh, private rooms and you can charge more for a private room as well. Then furnishing the home is going to be expensive. A good rough estimate is about $5,000 per bedroom if you want to have a pretty well furnished home with some nice touches, which we would recommend. And then of course, utilities are going to be important. Maintenance is going to be important. Capital expenditures, saving for a new roof for if HVAC goes out. 
similar to the maintenance and repair costs that you would have for any other investment is going to be similar from that perspective as well. Business costs. So your most important asset is going to be your staff, but that's also going to be your largest operational expense. If you think about it, you have to pay your staff for 24-7 care. There's got to be some caregivers in that home 24-7, 365 to take care of the residents. So you're going to have at least 168 hours a week of labor. And so consider this, if you're paying one caregiver $16 an hour for 24-7 labor, again, that's assuming they're rotating shifts, of course, that's going to be about $10,752 per month. So this is going to be a large expense. We won't get into the nitty gritty of, hey, how can you decrease that expense? And what are some other ways you can handle your staff? But just know that your staff is going to be your most important asset, but also your largest operational expense. So that's where it comes into play that the more residents that you can have, or even the more homes that you can have, where you can share staff amongst different homes that are in close proximity, is going to improve your bottom line, going to improve your cash flow dramatically. Operations, we hit on that with the staff. You're going to be responsible for utilities, food services, liability insurance, licensing fees, property maintenance, and then again, lease or mortgage, depending on what that looks like. So the operation expenditure is pretty substantial. And then of course, payroll taxes, software, tools and supplies, a lot of operational expenses to consider as well. There's also the marketing. So marketing and placement of residents can be very time consuming and very expensive. We've all kind of seen those commercials for a place for mom and some of these other agencies. Those are placement agencies and they charge a lot. Typically, I'd say month rate or a month and a half rate in terms of it. So you're looking at $5,000 per resident for placement in one of these homes. And depending on the complexity of the resident, sometimes these folks are only in these homes for 18 months or less. So it can be quite expensive from a marketing perspective. There's a lot of great ways to set up your home to organically get more residents and, and not be fully reliant on these placement agencies. And we'll talk some more about that here in a couple more slides. Step four, deciding to rent or buy. Okay, so this is important. It's important when we're thinking about buying or renting our primary residence. It's important for assisted living as well. You got to think about how much capital do you have to invest in a home and to invest in the operating business as well, because there's of course going to be startup costs for both. And if we're deciding to buy a home, oftentimes you're going to need to put minimum 20% down, but oftentimes 30% down or more, depending on what the lending environment looks like, or if you're having to go through a commercial bank. Leasing a home is going to require a lot less upfront capital and make it a little bit more flexibility. So typically folks who may have less cash on hand to get started, leasing a home might be a better option for you. It just really depends on where you're at in your financial status and what your goals are going forward, what the market dynamics are and how many homes are available from a lease perspective. Step five, evaluate and experience in partnerships. I think about this on like, how can you reduce your risk as an investor and increase your likelihood of success? Okay, so there's a lot of different ways to do this. Partnerships are a great way to do that. So you can partner with somebody who has more experience running an assisted living home or investing in an assisted living home, reach out to them. I always say having 10% of a deal is better than zero of a deal. And so you might have to give up a substantial amount of equity to partner with someone, but that might be your foot in the door to get started. I probably wouldn't do it for 10%, but just something to, to keep in mind from that perspective. You can also join a community. So a, a lot of times the inf information is available. You could probably scour the internet and uh, do some courses and find everything you need to know to get started investing in a residential assisted living home. And 90% of people will never do it. The reason is there's not a lot of implementation. There's not a lot of accountability. So joining a mastermind community can be really helpful for that. I've seen enormous growth in myself and my real estate investing experience and how our investments are have performed and opportunities I've had just by being in a mastermind. And so we're actually creating a, a mastermind. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's still a couple months away from getting launched. But that accountability can be really helpful. Another way you can do that is partner with a franchise. So there's franchises that exist for assisted living, for memory care, and they can help you go from zero to hero and help you launch your business. They do a lot of education and they really help you market the home, get the home fill and teach you how can you operate one of these homes? How can you hire caregivers? How can you provide good care? And they work with you to do that. Now, of course, there's a cost for that. You're paying a franchise fee and I'm sure that there's oftentimes a profit share model as well, but it's a way to decrease your risk, get you started, start making some more money. And oftentimes partnering with somebody can get you open a lot faster. And so think about that time velocity of money. If you're able to open an assisted living home six months sooner than you would if you were just watching YouTube videos, that's a substantial amount of money that's going to be made uh, in that six months time saving. So just something to think about as well. Step six, we're going to talk about funding the deal. I also split this up into two, funding the real estate and funding the business. SBA lending is the only financing option that I know of that you can lend on both the business and the real estate. 
Um, but for, for the sake of discussion and for this presentation, we'll look at funding them separately, funding the real estate, funding the business. And we'll talk a little bit about SBA lending as well. That's a way, like I said, you can fund both of these, the real estate and the business. I personally do not have any SBA lending experience, but we've talked to a bunch of different SBA lending um, banks and so forth as well. So funding the real estate, this is going to be pretty typical to your other alternative real estate investments, such as short-term rentals. You can get a traditional bank mortgage. Again, that's going to require 20 to 35% down. Oftentimes, this is a commercial loan. It does require personal guarantees. I'm not an attorney, but I'd recommend you still buy this in an LLC, but it is going to require personal guarantees. There's DSCR lending, so a debt service coverage ratio. So that's looking at what is the income of the property? What is that property projected to make an income? And how much debt service do they have? How much is it going to cost them per month uh, to pay for mortgage taxes and insurance? And there's different ratios that banks look at to figure out, hey, this is our debt service coverage ratio that we're going to lend on for a short term rental, for example, or for residential assisted living homes. Luckily, these homes do cash flow quite well and debt service coverage ratio lending is an option. They're easier to obtain, but they typically have a little bit less favorable terms in terms of interest rate being a little bit higher because the bank's not doing as much of an extensive underwriting into the borrower like some of these traditional bank mortgages are. They're really focused on, hey, what's the income of the property going to be? And they're lending based off that. So a little bit easier to get less favorable terms for that reason. You could certainly use private lending or private lenders as well. That's going to be completely variable based off who you're using as a private lender. Seller financing is an option. We're working in a seller finance deal right now, which is an awesome opportunity where we're buying a house for 6% down because that's what the seller wants. And then she's going to be the bank. She owns the house free and clear. And so then you can really adjust the terms how you want. And again, getting a house for 6% down is way better than paying 35% down. So some cool opportunities there in the seller financing space. Partnerships, as we talked about already, you can joint venture or syndicate, allowing you to pull resources and expertise to get started or to buy more of these homes. And then subject two is all the rage right now with Pace Morby in that crowd. And that's where you can take over an owner's mortgage without formally assuming the loan in exchange for the title of the deed. So you own the home and you're essentially taking over their mortgage payments, if that makes sense. That can There's a lot of nuances to that. We're actually working one of those deals uh, here potentially in the future as well. Uh, we'll see how that shakes out. Funding the business. So there's some similar ways to fund that as well. So personal savings, how much do you have saved up? Can you get a local bank business loan? Can you do private lending, partnerships, home equity line of credits, a possibility? Um, just be mindful of, hey, what's the interest rate? What are the payment terms of a HELOC? What's that look like? Is that really a good idea for you? Um, our business line of credit are some opportunities as well for funding the business. And then SBA lending. So SBA lending is a great option. It's a little bit more difficult if you're just getting started. It's easier if you have multiple of these homes. An SBA loan is a path where you can combine the real estate purchase and the business financing into one. So it can be really advantageous from that perspective. And folks are often able to wrap renovations as well as part of that SBA loan. So you can get a really full comprehensive loan that's going to cover renovations and reserves and um, purchasing the property and getting the business started and furnishings. They do have some pretty stringent eligibility criteria. You're going to have really detailed like operating financials, um, really meticulous record keeping is important. It's going to be easier to get a loan if you've been operating. Again, if typically if you have at least two years or so of operating, it can be easier. And oftentimes, if you have experience, you can get an SBA loan for as little as 10% down or less. It just depends on what your experience level is and how bankable you are from an SBA lending perspective. But it's a good option. For example, you could buy one home with a commercial loan and own and operate that for 12 months or more. And then you would look seasoned from an SBA perspective. And then maybe you can use an SBA loan to get your second home and business going um, from that perspective. So it can be really helpful to wrap all the financing into one would be an SBA loan. So let's spend some time talking about your ideal home. And so I, I broke this up on location, features, and licensability. Some of this is going to be repetitive, but I think we learn more where things are repeated over and over. But your ideal home. So looking at location, it's just as important in a residential assisted living home as it is in any real estate investment. Okay, so location is going to be so important. You're going to want to make sure you're in a safe and affluent area. The reason that that's important is, like I mentioned before, oftentimes... The folks that are putting their family members into these homes are going to be the, the child of the grandparent or the child of the mom and dad. And so you're going to want to be in a safe and affluent area because private pay is going to pay more. And so if you're in a safe and affluent area, they're more than likely going to be able to afford private pay for the home, which you're going to be able to charge a higher rate and frankly make more money. This is, uh, this is from an investing perspective. And of course, we want the home to be in a safe area as well in a nice neighborhood because we want it to be a fantastic home for these residents. 
it's helpful to be near a highway or have some easy access to the home for multiple reasons. One, it's easy for the family to come visit, but it's also easy for the residents to get the care that they need in clinics, hospitals, et cetera. And I typically tell folks, try and avoid an HOA if you can. It's just another headache. It's not impossible. In fact, there's some federal fair housing laws that actually uh, prevent an HOA from being able to say, hey, you can't operate a residential assisted living home in this area, but it's just one more headache that it's not necessarily worth dealing with. So just something to keep in mind, I would say, try and avoid HOAs if you can. And then location, if it's a nice home in a nice location, it's going to be a little bit easier to hire staff as well. And be thinking about, hey, do I want to have multiple of these homes in close proximity so I can share staff amongst these different homes? Um, like I said before, that's going to decrease your operational expenses and could be beneficial from that perspective. Some features of the actual structure of the home that's important is you want a single story home. There are people that have multiple story homes. You'd want to make sure that you have a lot of bedrooms on the main level. And oftentimes an elevator would be best or a stair chair. I really say, hey, if you're just getting started, there's really no reason not to buy a single story home. A single story home with as many bedrooms and bathrooms is going to give you as much opportunity as you can to house as many residents as possible. A good rule of thumb to think about when you're looking at the size of these homes is you want about 300 square feet per resident. So if you have 10 residents, a 3,000 square foot home is a good estimate of what's going to probably meet your licensing requirements or your regulation and zoning requirements and also give you enough space that you're able to comfortably provide care to 10 residents. So about 300 square foot per resident. You'll need that handicap accessible shower, equipped kitchen, comfortable living area, good curb appeal is important. When family members are coming to visit the home or they're coming to tour the home, it's really important to have a good curb appeal. That's the first thing that they're going to see as well. From a licensability perspective, we already hit on a lot of these. You want to make sure it's appropriate zoning. You're likely going to need sprinklers and a indoor fire alarm monitoring system. Again, look at the minimum bedroom square footage. Some folks, it's 160 square feet is the minimum bedroom size to have two residents in the room. It just depends on your location. You have to have egress windows for bedrooms or at least a path of escape if that's a door that's going to the outside or egress windows. And then again, the homes are going to have accessibility features that are required. Some areas that's going to be wider doorways, wheelchair ramps, etc. And then it does the house meet distance requirements from other licensed homes as well. So that's what makes up your ideal residential assisted living home. Again, this is a broad overview. It's going to be de dependent on where you're investing, what the regulations are, what the zoning is. But this is a broad overview of what to think about when you're starting to think about looking at homes, point upon Redfin, et cetera. Step eight is going to be hiring your staff. Again, this is the most important thing. Great caregivers are going to be the key to your success. You're going to want to treat them like gold if you find a good one and really hold on to them. And that might require paying more than you feel comfortable with or offering some more benefits, but it's going to be really important. There's 24 seven care that's going to be needed for true assisted living. So you got to keep that in mind. There's some different positions that you're going to need to fill and we'll hit on those quickly. So you can have a licensed manager and a licensed manager is great if you're a busy healthcare professional and you also want to own the real estate and the operation, but maybe not manage the day-to-day -day care, you could hire a manager. This becomes a little bit easier to do when you have multiple homes so you can pay their salary based off multiple homes, but it's typically a salaried position to run the total operations of your home. Like I said, usually a few homes, different states have different regulations in terms of how many homes a licensed manager can manage. So it's something to keep in mind, um, but that's an option if you want to start the business uh, and own the business and also in the real estate is, hey, maybe you just have a licensed manager that helps you out. Then next uh, is going to be a lead caregiver. They typically update the manager. If you have one, train your other staff. And they're uh, the ones that are really staying in tune with the residents and family, making sure compliance is met, making sure top-notch care is being provided at all times. Pay is going to vary, but ballpark like $18 to $23 per hour, depending on location, is what you can think about from that perspective. And again, it's hard to hire. Folks can go work at Whataburger and make $18 per hour, or they can come work at your assisted living home and make $18 per hour. So you need to make sure that you're paying them well, paying them more than what they could make based off other jobs in your location, and you're treating them really so that they want to stay and work for you. Um, then you have certified caregivers. They often work from 36 to 48 hours per week, and they provide most of the day-to-day -day care. Their pay varies, 15 to 19 dollars per hour, depending on the location. And then sometimes there'll be assistant caregivers. They'll provide more of the non-medication related care under supervision with caregivers. And they typically will assist with cooking, cleaning, some of the other tasks as well, helping out those certified caregivers. And oftentimes these folks are on a path towards certification. Their pay is typically a little bit less, but they have a, a little bit less responsibility within the homes. Hiring the staff, like I mentioned, is really difficult. And there's a lot of different ways where you can hire staff or find staff. So local schools, training medical assistants might be a good one. Training nursing aides as well at some of these local schools can be helpful. Yard signs in like busy places on weekends like malls or town centers. Some folks have had some good success with job websites like Indeed, LinkedIn, 
There's a lot of different Facebook groups for caregivers and operators that you can find some caregivers from time to time and operators. Employee referral programs can be well. Medical partners like uh, different clinics, home health agencies can be helpful as well. You can use social media to try and hire. So there's a lot of different ways to try and hire. And then it can be helpful to have a QR code available, our business card with a QR code um, that can help with uh, hiring folks online. So there's lots of different ways to find them. But like I said before, if you find great caregivers or great operators, you got to hold on to them. Super important. Step nine is going to be building a, a marketing plan. So this is when the home is ready to go and you're ready to start filling it up and get some residents. You have to market. And this isn't what many operators are thinking about when they're getting into a residential assisted living home. And oftentimes it's not a skill that a lot of us have is building a marketing plan. But to be successful, to be a successful residential assisted living business, you're going to need to either master marketing or you're going to have to hire that out. And that can be quite expensive. We talked about the placement agencies earlier, which typically charge about 120% of the monthly resident rate. So that can really add up if you're paying $5,000, $5,400 or so every 18 months or so to get more residents in the home. So some other ways that you can market and some ways you can attract residents without a placement agency, it can be really helpful and make you in a more financially favorable situation if you're able to do that. Some ways to do that, referrals from resident families are huge. Uh, referrals are such a great way and you can incentivize your residents uh, to provide referrals uh, as well. Okay, maybe you take a couple hundred dollars off their monthly rate for each person they refer or something like that can be quite beneficial. That can be either the resident referring them or the resident's family referring them. Social media is huge, a Facebook page, LinkedIn. Google My Business is really helpful. There's a lot of untapped potential with Google My Business where you can get more and more reviews and then get more and more organic traffic to your home that will help you fill your home up with more residents. Some folks would do online ads. Uh, a lot of times folks would do local events like open houses or go to different senior events in the community and set up a booth and, and share more about their home. But it's important to tell everyone about your business. You never know, same with real estate investing. You never know who wants to invest in real estate unless you tell everybody that you know that you're investing in real estate. Just something to keep in mind as you're going forward. The more residents you can attract without requiring a placement agency is gonna be better for you going forward. Step 10 is going to be prepare to launch. And we really hit everything to get you to that point. Hopefully that was helpful. I'm sure I'm missing some things out of the presentation, but hopefully that's a helpful kind of 30,000 foot view of how you can get started investing in a residential assisted living home. Let's do a couple of deal deep dives real quick, and then we'll get to some questions. Okay. So as I mentioned before, we own the real estate and we lease that out to operators. Okay. So this is one of our homes. This is in Scottsdale, Arizona. This is actually a memory care home, which focuses on taking care of residents with, with dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera, and who need a little bit more help, a little bit more assistance from a cognitive perspective in regards to their care. Uh, I have that with my two business partners, Charlie and Luke, who I mentioned before. This was the first deal we actually raised money for. So we raised $200,000, 11% simple interest. So this was a private lending scenario, not a JV scenario. Our investors don't have any equity in the deal, but they're getting that 11% simple interest, um, which is a great way to do it. It was actually crazy. I don't know. I'm sure there's people on here who have raised money, but raising money is such a humbling experience. And, and it was crazy. We did one webinar and then we like, one 45 minute webinar and we had way more investors who wanted to invest than we had the opportunity to give them or to provide them. So it was pretty crazy. There's a lot of interest in assisted living. So private lending investing is a way that you can do that. This house is eight bedrooms, three baths. It's licensed for 10 as a memory care home. We purchased it at 975. It was a seller finance deal, but we're paying 7% in interest, 20% down. Our lease fee is $11,000 per month that the operator is paying us in our lease fee. That's a five-year lease with a 3% annual increase. And so they're paying us that. The cool thing about leasing to an operator is these are commercial leases. So we're responsible for mortgage taxes, insurance, the roof, and the HVAC. That's about it. We do have property insurance on the home that insures the actual house, the actual structure itself, similar to your home. But we are not responsible for liability insurance for the actual care that falls on the operator. A lot of folks ask that question. So the actual operator is responsible for all the liability insurance for the care that they provide for the residents that they provide. Of course, our homeowner's insurance also covers from a liability perspective as well, but really looking at mortgage taxes, insurance, and then the roof of the home plus or minus HVAC. Everything else, the operator pays for. So any of the minor maintenance they're paying for, if the dishwasher stops working, their responsibility is to fix that. We do provide our operators with a uh, home warranty to help with that, but they're responsible for that deductible to use the home warranty, but it can help cut down costs. 
The other thing about a lease structure is typically you're going to have a ramp up period because it takes time for new operators or for folks coming in and taking over vacant homes to start filling those homes. So typically you have a ramp up period where you'll offer one month free and a couple months half off, or it just depends what you negotiate with your operator, but typically expect some sort of ramp up period before you're getting that full $11,000 lease fee for this home, for example. We also private lended $25,000 to the operator to help him buy the business because we weren't purchasing the business, we were purchasing the real estate. He was coming in and purchasing the business because he was going to be operating that. The only reason we did that is he's like, hey, I just want to have some more upfront capital in case something goes wrong, even though he had a pretty substantial amount of funds on his proof of funds. So we private lended him $25,008%. So that cash flows us an extra $209 per month. And this house cash flows us $3,387 per month. And that's after paying our investors. So if we took in the $916 per month that we're paying each investor who invested $100,000, we'd be cash flowing over $5,000 on this one house, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Another deal was a little bit different. And I wanted to include this because this house uh, is different. So this is not a residential assisted living home for elderly care. This is a behavioral living home. So initially this, we bought this house as a transitional living home. So that's a different type of assisted living home for think of sober living. And we were planning on doing sober living out of this house. It was also licensed to be a residential assisted living home or a behavioral care home as well. I think it's really important to have multiple different exit plans, even in residential assisted living, but really important in any real estate investing class. But this was going to initially be a sober living home or a transitional living home. Long story short, there was a lot of fraud that happened in the transitional living market and how they get paid by the state. And so the state cut off payments. And so our operator was not getting paid to, uh, to provide care to this home. We ended up having to evict them. And then now we have a behavioral operator in there. So this home's actually for kids with disabilities, which is a really cool niche within assisted living. Same two partners own this. This is a five bedroom home that has like an extra office that can be used as a bedroom. So a six bedroom home, three bathrooms. It's licensed for 10 residents. Again, that commercial lease, we purchased it for 530,000. The lease fee is going to be $6,500 per month, which once we hook up the sprinkler system, which should be any day now, right now it's currently $5,000 per month. But once we have that $6,500 per month coming in, this house will cash flow about $3,400 per month passively. We don't have any investors on this. We bought this house with our own reserves, our own business reserves out of pocket. Um, so those are two different deals we have. Again, we we own the real estate, lease it out to an operator. Uh, I have a couple more slides here of just some homes that we're working on. This house is an off-market deal we're working on. It's eight bedrooms, four bathrooms, licensed for 10, under contract for 740,000. Comps in the area are about 850. This is the seller finance house that I mentioned. We're only putting 6% down, so it's going to cost us about $45,000 out of pocket to get in this home. And we'll be paying about a, we'll be paying a 6% interest rate on this. And we were quoted by our lender who we've used for all the other homes eight and a quarter. We're definitely coming out ahead with a two and a quarter rate to decrease compared to using a bank. This house should cash flow about $750 per partner and we're not raising any funds for this. Cash flow is a little bit less on this one because we're only putting 6% down. Work in this house as well, off market under contract on this for 740. The owner actually got an offer after we got under contract with a lease option for this house for 850. This is hopefully going to be a subject to, or we might just go ahead and, and get new bank financing for it. We're still trying to figure this out. We're working on a variance actually to increase the number of licensed residents for this house to 10. Working on that right now, but this house will cash flow over a thousand dollars per month. We'll have to raise about $50,000 to get into this home. And then this is our biggest project we're working on right now. This house is in Greenville, South Carolina. We actually are partnering with an operator through the memory care home. I forgot to mention the memory care home that I talked about for the first deal deep dive. The operator for that is actually working with a franchise, with a memory care franchise. And we've built a really good relationship and rapport with them. And we're actually partnering with them to expand into some other states. And so we're working with one of their operators to purchase a home in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, this one will be our first home that uh, was not already operating or licensed as an assisted living home or renovated into an assisted living home. So we're learning a lot about the renovation process and different regulations and so forth. So hopefully we'll be able to close this home. We still got a good bit of due diligence to do. That's another project that we're working on as well. It's going to require us to raise a good bit more capital because of the renovations, but we're going to be adding a lot of value to the property. And there's not a lot of licensed turnkey residential assisted living homes in this area. So that also will add a lot of value to the home.
What's next? I already hit on that. We're working on a home in Greenville. We're also working in Oklahoma City with that same memory care franchise. We're working on forming partnerships with different folks who are doing great things in the assisted living space. A few of them are actually on this call as well. We have an assisted living Facebook community that's been growing like crazy. We launched that back in November, I believe, and there's 7,700 people. There's 550 people joining every day. We just try to provide as much value as possible in that Facebook community. But full disclosure, we are launching a mastermind, hopefully in the next month and a half or so, called the Row Room Mastermind, where we are we are going to bring in experts in the space to partner with us and come in and teach folks how they can buy their first or their next residential assisted living home. We're going to have a couple calls per week and then also likely some accountability pods as well. And a lot of those calls are going to be tactical, but they're also going to be some basics in real estate investing, setting up your finding, funding and those sorts of things as well. We talked to a lot of people in our community and there are a few other education platforms in the space that are quite expensive but don't provide the resources that you think you're going to obtain i won't say any names and then you get to the end of their course and they're like oh for forty thousand dollars more then you can have access to all our contacts and we'll help coach you through we really think that a mastermind is going to allow us to have that contact in more of a group coaching environment and provide folks the implementation and the accountability that they need to get started. And we're going to provide every resource that we know or try and find that for you. That's coming soon and we're excited about that. I mentioned the 10 step guide to launching your first assisted living home. It is based off this PowerPoint, but it has a lot more detail. So if you want to get that, you can scan the QR code or like I said before, I will send the link out as well. And you can go ahead and just click there, sign up and get that delivered right to your email. Hopefully that's helpful. I think it's 27 pages or so. A little bit more information than what I provided for this PowerPoint. I also, I don't know how Linda Garcia is drawing on that. That's pretty cool. I've never seen that before. <laughs> I don't <laughs> <it> is either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. Interesting. And then I had Alex on the Physicians and Properties podcast. That's a community I created for physicians to try and teach docs how investing in real estate can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want. I think this QR code is set to go to Alex's podcast episode that he did on there, which was awesome talking about short-term rentals. Um, but feel free to check out Physicians and Properties if you want as well. Here's my contact information. Feel free to email me, physiciansandproperties at gmail.com. Find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever, whatever you need to do or want to do. Feel free to reach out and happy to help folks in any way. I love having the opportunity to talk about residential assisted living and real estate investing in general, but I really love when it's a healthcare community because we, like I said before, we work really hard providing great care to our patients. And oftentimes we're not rewarded like we should be in terms of compensation and also in terms of appreciation. So just know that I appreciate all you guys and all you're doing for patients. And I know how hard it is to, to work every day taking care of folks. So without any further ado, we can hop into some questions if folks have them and go from there. There's probably some in the chat here. Feel free to just shout them out too. Yeah, if you guys want to jump in, just go ahead and raise your hand. We'll try to do like maybe five minutes here because I know we're running a little bit over time here. But so many questions here. And not only that, there's been a lot of people that stayed on the call, which means that a lot of people are interested usually by towards the end, like a bunch of people are dropping off. But there was a question by James. He's asking the questions about payment, if it's coming from government or personal funds. My question is, what, is there a huge drop off from that? And what do you think the average payment's going to be like per resident? I know that's probably a huge loaded question and there's probably a lot of variability, but give us an idea here. Yeah, absolutely. One of the slides we hit on that, the average rate was about $4,500 per month. That's the average. That's encompassing both government rate and private pay rate. There is typically a drop off if you're getting government funded rates, whether that's through Medicare and so forth or if that's private pay. I typically tell folks if you're gonna invest and you wanna make as much cash flow as possible, you wanna try and maximize as much private pay residence as you can, because they're gonna pay a lot more. I don't have a good answer for you in terms of what the difference is, but it, it's pretty substantial. I, I think probably going from 4,500 to 3,000 would be reasonable in terms of the difference. Uh, $1,500 per month per resident would be reasonable. But I, like I said, I don't operate these homes, so I don't have the inside scoop in terms of what exactly that would be. But it's going to be very state dependent. Missouri is about $3,300 per month is the median. Washington, D.C. is $7,800 um, per month is the median. So it just really depends on the state. Hopefully Alex, that answers you, James' questions. Where are you getting the data? Because I know like when we look at like for renting homes out, we can look on Zillow and see how much it's going to yeah. rent for. Or I, I can look on AirDNA and it'll tell me how much my short-term rental is going to rent for. Are there any resources that'll help us do some research when looking to purchase mm -hmm. a home, like to, to determine whether it's going to be a profitable investment for us? Or 
Yeah, Alex, that's a great question. There's a website called Genworth who puts out a lot of data in regards to senior living. And if you go to Genworth, I believe if you just Google Genworth assisted living rates or Genworth resident rates, that'll come up and you can actually put your zip code in or your city in and that'll give you the median rate. That's So that's one way that's really helpful. They have a ton of data, genworth.org, I believe. And then you can look up a lot of senior living statistics on different platforms and different statistic websites and figure that out as well. And then a place for mom has actually a lot of data too. So there's multiple different places where you can corroborate that information. But Genworth is a really easy way to give you a ballpark idea. And then you can go even use kind of the, what is it, the enemy method for short-term rentals, where you just go on Google and pretend you're putting a mom in a home and talk to these different homes and figure out what their rates are and what they're charging. And that's not a bad way to do it too. If you're getting started in an area and you're trying to figure out, hey, what can I uh, potentially uh, offer as a resident rate? A really cool strategy where you're leasing this out. And Benji had a question and he says, do you try to find the operator first or find the house first? And then I guess the second part of that is where can you find the operators? Yeah, Benji, uh, great question. We love the lease to operator method for multiple reasons. One, the cash flow, frankly, is as good or better as a short term rental without the Airbnb messages and the stress of managing it. And so we do like that. To find operators, we typically will try and find the operators first that as we're under contract on the home. Oftentimes, the bank will not let you close on the home until you have a signed lease or an operator in place, which is good because that helps to protect you as well. Of course, you don't want to like close on this assisted living home that you don't have an operator for that then you're paying out of pocket or scrambling to try and figure out how to operate. So typically, you're going to want to have a signed lease before you close on the home. Where to find operators? And there's that similar is if you're hiring caregivers or you're hiring staff. So different Facebook groups will have operators in them. Indeed, posting on LinkedIn, working with a franchise can be helpful to try and find operators. And then one thing that's really important that I meant to hit on that I should have, probably one of the most important people that you can get in contact with first is going to be a residential assisted living realtor or a realtor who specializes in residential assisted living. They exist and they're such a great resource because they often know the regulations that are required. They know what makes a good home. They know what the competition is. They typically have a Rolodex of operators as well. So that can be really beneficial, almost a one-stop shop from that perspective. It's hard to find them. If you spend some time on bigger pockets and doing some Googling and reaching out to folks for referrals, you can find them and that can really save you a lot of time and be really beneficial as well. I want to ask a couple more questions. Randy's asking a question here about your PDF that you're going to provide us here, because it seems like you're just starting to scratch the surface on there's so many different like subspecialty of mm -hmm. assisted living facilities, like there's memory care, sober living, behavioral. Will your PDF have a list of like some of those subspecialties out there? No, I don't think, I think the PDF we have is just focused more on residential assisted living. The premise behind it is similar. The, the care that you're providing is what's going to be different. Of course, if you're having a sober living home, you're not going to need like a wheelchair accessible home. So it, it just depends, but that's a good thing to add. I'm going to take a note here to potentially add that to the PDF, or maybe in the future, we will reach out and, and add something that has that on there. I have a few blog posts on physiciansandproperties.com that breaks out the different types of assisted living homes, similar to what's being asked. So that's something you could take a look at as well. But if you spend some time Googling different types of residential assisted living homes or different types of assisted living homes, you could certainly find something. One last thing, someone is asking the Facebook group one last time, so that way they could possibly oh, join that. I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever shared it. Let me, let me pull up the link here real quick and I'll post it in the chat if anyone's interested. Alex, I'm good to go as long as you want. So if folks have other questions and, and you have availability, I'm, I'm fine with answering some more. Okay, questions. maybe a couple more questions here. I know. Yeah, really fine. Chessie Garcia, she wants to jump in here and ask a question. Chessie, why don't you go ahead and jump oh. on in here? Awesome. Thank you so much, first of all, for having this. It's a lot of good information. My question is, for those of us who are starting from the bare bones, building a business plan, what are some costs or typical line items that people don't usually think about to include in their business plan? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Let me scroll back here. We had a slide that was talking about real estate costs and business costs. There's a slide here that has real estate costs and business costs. And in the PDF, we also tried to break that down with more detail. Sorry, that's real estate cost here. But business costs, so staff, of course, food, you're going to be providing food services for the residents, utilities, there's going to be liability insurance for the actual care of the residents, licensing fees, property maintenance, whether you're leasing or paying the mortgage for the home, and then payroll, taxes, software and tools that are going to be needed. There's electronic medical records that are typically used in these homes as well. Different supplies if you want to do crafts or some fun resident events and so forth can be helpful as well. 
So those are some operations. We try and break them out a lot more in that PDF of some other ones. I have a question. What are some of the biggest mistakes some rookie investors or when you're first starting out, what are some of those mistakes that people make when getting into this type of investing? That's a great question, Alex. I, I hit on it earlier. I think folks, so there's a lot of opportunity here. There is, there's a lot of ways that you can cash flow uh, and cash flow is more difficult to find these days, frankly, in real estate investing. And I think a lot of times folks think, oh, let me just turn any house into a residential assisted living home. And that is not a good idea. And other things is folks think that it's easy. It, it is a ton of work. It's a lot of work if you're gonna lease to an operator because it takes a lot of time to find the operators, vet the operators, find the realtors, find the homes, renovate the homes. It's a lot of work either way you do, whether you're leasing to an operator or you're running the operations. Certainly more work if you're running the operations, but a lot of times folks just think, oh, hey, I have this three bedroom, two bath house that's two stories, that's 1500 square feet, that's gonna be perfect. It's not, it's just not gonna work. You're not gonna be able to get the number of residents in there. And, and you really should try and focus on a single story house if you're gonna try and get into this space. Conversely, what are some of the things that you have done that's been like wildly successful? Like you're like, oh man, I need to do this for every single residential assisted living. Yeah, that's awesome. One thing I wouldn't say necessarily is wildly successful, but we need you need to make sure if you're doing the lease to operator space, really vet the operator well. And the proof of funds is really important. Like I said before, we ran into eviction of a sober living home because they didn't have enough funds. They had a decent amount of funds, but they didn't have enough to sustain the multiple homes that they were operating when when they stopped paying the transitional living operators. And that's something that's really important. Make sure that the operator, if you're doing a lease to operate model, has adequate funds, not only to cover the lease fee for your home, but also your other homes that they're operating as well. And then just a broad overview, like it's really important to get into a community like this where folks are doing big things in real estate that you can surround yourself with. Your network really is going to be your net worth, as corny as that saying is. It's really important. And, and I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for my business partners and for other partners that we've made along the way. And that's so important. I, oftentimes folks think, hey, I, I, I don't want to partner with anybody because I want 100% of this deal. Oftentimes that leads to not ever buying a deal. And so if you have to partner with someone, do it. But remember, a partnership is a marriage. And so it's really important to make sure that you are working well together and have complementary skill sets. But that's another thing I tell folks often, don't be afraid to partner earlier on if that's what's going to help you get started and do well. Let's take one last question because I want to be respectful of everyone's time as well. Luis, he's asking, how do you find your off-market deals for residential assisted living? What's your criteria to let your agent know? Yeah. That's a good question. So if you can find a residential assisted living realtor who specializes in, that's going to be uh, really helpful because they're going to, they're probably going to be able to tell you best what your criteria should be. And so that can be helpful. Buy box. I see James just mentioned a question there that will help answer Lewis's question. Really, it's going to be single story, at least 300 square foot per resident, as many bedrooms and bathrooms as you can get. Ideally, if you can find a home that's already been operating as an assisted living home, um, which has already had the renovations typically, like the sprinkler system, the fire alarm monitoring panel, that can be really helpful. The grab bars, as many renovations as already are done, can be beneficial because then you don't have to worry about doing those renovations as well. And if it's already licensed, hey, at least it meets criteria to be licensed again if that license has expired, or ideally you can continue to use their license. But those are some things that I think about when we're looking at these homes. We typically, like I said, try and get as many bedrooms as bathrooms as possible. I can't work that enough. E even our our behavioral home, ideally, like we should probably have more than five bedrooms. And, and so if you're thinking about getting started, I would say minimum five bedrooms. And ideally, if you could have some flex space, like you could convert a garage or there's an extra living room that you can convert into a bedroom. Those are some great ways to add more bedrooms as well and increase the number of residents. Off-market deals, you can find some of these the same way you find any other off-market deal. And it's, it's a matter of, are you trying to go after homes that are already renovated? Or are you trying to just find these large single story homes that you can convert into one? And the avenues amongst doing each of those would be a little bit different, but hopefully that's helpful. Alex, I just wanted to answer one more question that Dennis just put in there because that uh, is uh, confusing. A RCFE is a residential care facility for the elderly, which is the exact same thing as a residential assisted living home. For some reason, California wants to be different and they call them RCFEs. So it commonly confuses okay. folks as well. Same exact thing. Hey, uh, Alex, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Like I said, I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. Uh, we'll have the replay up on my Facebook page. Not only that, if you uh, logged on to Zoom. I'm going to uh, send the replay out and we'll get the free ebook and all of those goodies that uh, Alex will uh, uh, give. Uh, where can people get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me wherever Facebook, LinkedIn, just my name, Alex Schlow. Instagram is A Schlow3, Physicians and Properties. The 
residential assisted living group, all of the above, you can find me and that'll be included in the PowerPoint I'll share with Alex as well. So yeah, feel free to reach out. Happy to help in any way. Awesome. Thank you so much for this presentation. High level presentation. So many people interested in doing this. With that said, thank you everyone. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate the opportunity.